that coach looked like you had three or four opportunities to hit on touchdown passes and just couldn't connect. Can you talk about that? What a big factor it was. <laughs> yeah, it's a big factor if you're going to miss touchdowns. Uh, hey, Brian, can you sort of take us through your mind, first of all, as TJ's making that play on the fourth down? Yeah, good yeah. questions. Um, I probably can't repeat what's going through my mind. I want to issue a challenge, and I want it to be heard right now. You know, we got a huge game next week at 12 o'clock in Athens, Georgia. We'll have an opportunity to put on a heck of a show at 12 o'clock in Sanford Stadium next week. Thanks, and go dogs. Oh, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I got to be honest with you scrambling here to find stuff to talk about on the show we're really hitting the dead period thankfully next week we got some recruiting talk even though shane and i are going to be on vacation we're still going to find ways to get you out some episodes next week but thankfully i got my buddy brian stoltz on the line is going to talk some auburn football and what's going on down there Derek mason gone to oklahoma all these coaching staff changes brian harson is he coaching for his job already going into year two? We'll get into that. Some really great stuff with Brian in just a minute. But there was a little bit of news here around the league. This is basically the only thing that I saw that I thought was bringing to anyone's attention here. But uh, LSU, if you missed it, we had Preston Guy on the last show to talk about uh, Brian Kelly and what's been going on in Baton Rouge, all the momentum they got. Well, we probably should have waited today because the momentum – has not stopped here on Wednesday. LSU picked up a commitment from Jarek Bernard Converse. And you may be saying, well, who the hell's that? How about this? An all Big 12 corner with 47 games of experience. He was a all Big 12 selection last year. 51 tackles, 11 passes defended. And of course, LSU lost Eli Ricks in the transfer portal to Alabama. A lot of people had Ricks as the number one corner in the transfer portal. This uh, Bernard Converse, number two, according to, uh, I believe, 24-7 Sports had it rated that way. So you hate to lose Ricks, but next best guy in the rankings coming on down. And you add this to Joe Fouché, Greg Brooks, and the Louisiana defensive back that uh, LSU picked up here recently. We got a whole new secondary, and that's exactly what the Tigers needed after suffering some defections, some decommitments. Brian Kelly and company have retooled this secondary with a lot of talent, basically overnight heading into spring football, just continue to be blown away by the job that Brian Kelly and company are doing down there at LSU. And it, you know, that's the standard, you know, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. You hire a coach that's been to multiple college football playoffs. He's been to the BCS national championship game. No excuse not to have LSU humming. And that certainly seems to be the standard already being set by Brian Kelly in Baton Rouge. Now, speaking of last episode, if you missed it, we shared the debut Heisman Trophy odds from Caesar Sportsbook. And my goodness, I thought that'd be a fun topic. I didn't think it would result in just 24 hours of crazy mentions on the Twitter. So that was a topic a lot of people wanted to discuss. And so, we're, hey, we're bringing it back because I got a handful of guys here that I think deserve to be on that list. The biggest snubs that were not mentioned by Caesar Sportsbooks in the debut Heisman Trophy odds for the 2022 season. And I think the two most obvious names, hell, the only Georgia Bulldog they had on there, and I don't even know if he's on the team, Marie Gilbert, that ain't good enough, man. Where's Stetson Bennett? He's got to be at the top of that list. Not necessarily of, of Heisman contenders, but players that were not even listed. I mean, we got backups listed on this thing. We got guys that have taken seven snaps at Ohio State on the list. Reigning national champion, got to put Stetson Bennett on that list because you know if he comes back in the and Georgia's as good as they were last season, but it's led by the offense this time around, Stetson Bennett's going to find himself in New York as a Heisman finalist. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but, I mean, he's got a national championship under the belt. we got to stop doubting the man. Stetson Bennett, you got to at least have him on the list. Now, sticking right there in Athens, 
I think uh, arguably the best player remaining on the team, and that's saying a lot considering all the talent they got there at Georgia, Brock Bowers. I mean, how can you deny this guy? 882 receiving yards, 13 touchdowns as a true freshman, and he was unguardable in the college football playoff. He was just a freak athlete. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone quite like him in the SEC, just being at this hybrid tight end receiver type that uh, can basically do it all. I think he returned kicks in high school. I mean, he's that damn talented. So where's Brock Bowers? Need to see him on the list when uh, the next Heisman odds come out. I bet Brock Bowers is definitely on there. Now, how about this guy? I mean, Kentucky gets overlooked each and every year. This guy's about to shatter the school rushing record. Chris Rodriguez, nearly 1,400 rushing yards. He averaged over six yards per carry on 225 Attempts last season with 10 touchdowns. Now, I know he had the fumbling issues, but with Wondell Robinson off to the NFL, Chris Rodriguez is going to have to increase his production if Kentucky's going to contend for an SEC East title, which many expect they will next season. Chris Rodriguez, you got to at least put him on there, given everything he's accomplished at Kentucky. He's going to be the workhorse. Will Levis, good to see him get some respect, but give me Chris Rodriguez all day. I think he's going to be the star of Kentucky's offense next season. And how about this? Uh, surprise, this guy didn't make the cut based on just how dominant he was at the tail end of the season. We saw Hendon Hooker on the list. What about Cedric Tillman, who you know lit up Purdue? He had, I believe, three touchdowns against Purdue. He had over 100 yards against Alabama and Georgia. I believe he scored a touchdown in both of those games. So he's doing it against the best defenses he's facing. And he was just incredibly hot down the stretch for Hendon Hooker. Clearly, Tennessee's number one with Hendon Hooker back, Cedric, Til Cedric Tillman returning. I mean, we, I don't even know, we could be looking at an unprecedented 20 touchdown season from Cedric Tillman, which we got to give him some buzz, at least throw him on a list like this because he could blow up next season. Now, speaking of blowing up, this guy, this guy may take the SEC by storm. Next season, I don't think enough people are talking about him. But let's go on down to College Station because they got one hell of a running back in Devon Achain. Only, only I say, 910 rushing yards last year. But here's the thing, over seven yards per carry, nine touchdowns. And, of course, he was splitting time with Isaiah Spiller. Spiller off to the NFL. It's going to be the Devon Achain show next season. If Texas A&M, we don't even know who the quarterback's going to be. If it Max Johnson, Connor Wigman, uh, we've got uh, Haynes King. Let's not forget, lost for the season early last year. We're going to have whoever the quarterback is, they're going to be relying on Devon Achain. I think the offense is going to run through Achain next year. Got to put them at least on this list here. And then last, a little bit of a wild card here, but we need some representation from Missouri. And, hey, this is going to sound maybe a little crazy, but – I think the hype is going to match the talent here for five-star freshman Luther Burden, the receiver, in-state receiver there that uh, turned down an offer from, well, basically every college in America, but uh, picked Missouri, signed with Missouri over Georgia was his other finalist there. So Luther Burden, you know, I think he's going to have to do it all for the Missouri Tigers next season, including playing some special teams, being a human highlight reel for Eli Drinkowitz and company. Now, realistically, is he going to win the Heisman next year? No, but I think at least you got to give him odds because, you know, if he comes onto the scene and he's an elite, elite playmaker in the SEC like anticipated, why not? Let's give him some buzz now before. I'd rather have, some, I'd rather have him on the list now than uh, miss out as someone that we should have seen coming. And that's why I'm putting Luther Burden on my preseason Heisman list. Someone at least deserves consideration. All right, so hey, that's all I got on uh, the news side. Like I said, a very slow time here. Coming to a screeching halt. Need National Signing Day to get here sooner rather than later to kind of come up with show topics here. But that's why I got my man Brian Stoltz on the line. A really, really interesting interview. I mean, he doesn't hold anything back here. He thinks... Uh, Auburn may have a new head coach soon, and it sounds like Brian's got the man for the job. So let's kick it over to our interview with Brian Stoltz. Well, we're pleased to be joined by Brian Stoltz. Give him a follow 
Brian J. Stoltz on the Twitter machine. He's a staff writer for AuburnSports.com. And we used to work together at Saturday Down South. Brian, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hey, absolutely. Anytime, Michael. And, hey, I know before we get rolling here, I, of course, I had you on to talk some Auburn football and all the shenanigans going on down there. I got to ask you this because I think the first time you you came on my radar before we even started working together, you went golfing with Hugh Freeze. Can you can you share any backstory on on what was what's it like golfing with Hugh Freeze? Hey, hey Hugh Freeze has been uh, become one of my best friends. Uh, he's a great guy, uh, great coach. Who you know he's owned up for his mistakes. Uh, I, I go up to Lynchburg at Liberty and uh, visit him all the time. And, you know, he always picks up my golf round, so I'm appreciative of that. Uh, I, beat, I beat him a couple times, even though he's given me a couple strokes. But, uh, yeah, he's a great guy and uh, a lot of fun to hang out with. And uh, if he gets – it's going to be really soon before he gets a uh, uh, another big job. And I think he can do uh, great things for uh, another SEC school. Yeah, well, well, hey, yeah, this will be the last thing I ask you on that, but – you know, just because you've referenced it, I wanted to ask you anyway. Do you think that uh, sometime in the future, he's such a good coach, do you think he does find his way back to the SEC? Oh, absolutely. I, I know that he wants to be back in the SEC. He wants another chance to rewrite his story. Uh, he's just uh, a great coach. I mean, he's turned Malik Willis into a third-string guy, into a first-round pick. Uh, he's done amazing things with, you know, what the limited things they have at uh, Liberty, winning three straight bowl games, uh, finishing in the top 25 two years ago, or I'm sorry, last year. And, uh, yeah, he, he wants to be back in, uh, where he belongs. And, you know, he's a Mississippi, Mississippi boy. Uh, so he, uh, wants to be back South and, um, yeah, I'm rooting for the guy. I mean, I love the guy. Uh, I never thought I'd say that because I was always critical of him back in like 2016 and 17. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I I really like the guy and I think he deserves another chance to uh, win in the SEC. Well, shifting gears to the program, you know the best in the league. You, I believe you graduated from Auburn. Of course, you live down there covering the team. What went so wrong for Brian Harson and company towards the tail end of that season? Because I think too many people forget that uh, they were in control of their own destiny in the West, uh, you know, heading into November, I believe. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny, 6-2, and two, they were uh, in charge of their own destiny, and then they got kind of uh, ramshackled by Texas A&M at Texas A&M, which is expected, but they still won a SEC West over that. And then they jump out on Mississippi State 28-3, to three, and then things just go haywire from there. Bo Nix gets hurt. Uh Daniel Carlson gets hurt. Uh, there's a lot of uh, miscommunication on the uh, between the uh, assistants. I would say, uh, you know, between the, between the SEC guys, the Boise guys, Harson is bringing in his own guys now, uh, and then the Iron Bowl, the, the collapse in the Iron Bowl, which was so frustrating to watch because the defense have played the game of their life against Bryce Young and that and talented uh, Alabama team, and uh, and then just a bowl game that, yeah, I, I, it's just hard to see because it's hard to judge them but because, one, Bo Nix was out uh, for the last three games. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, but, but still, they should beat South Carolina. They should beat Houston without, with a backup quarterback. And uh, this thing started going downhill then. Uh, Derek Mason left, you know, recently. Mike Bobo was fired. Uh, there's been some other staff changes uh, Harson's bringing his own guys that um, that he likes to hang around with and coach with. Uh, if that works, fine. If it not, if it doesn't, he's going to die with his own guys. Uh, but yeah, the the attitude around this team and this program right now is uh, pretty uh, darn negative, I would say. Yes, yeah, sir. I got to ask you about Derek Mason. You you reference it right there. They just made it official here on Wednesday afternoon. He's going to be the new defensive coordinator at Oklahoma State. And I know they had a good year. You know, I'm not trying to diminish what they are, but I think in most people's eyes, Auburn is a lot better football program than Oklahoma State. So what do you make of all that, of uh, of Derek Mason leaving for a lateral at best uh, job? From what I, from all I've heard is that he was miserable the entire season. And that, uh, he, you know, he, he was sick a couple of times. 
Uh, he might or might not have passed out at halftime of uh, the uh, bowl game. Uh, but he was miserable most of the time. He didn't get along with uh, some of the guys on the staff, maybe Harson, and uh, he just wanted to change. And uh, uh, I, I like the guy, room for him. I thought it was a good hire. Uh, you know, he's kind of changed the defense this year, and they had a little trouble with the zone, especially in the secondary at times. But uh, he's a good guy. Uh, I wish him the best. Now, what do you make of, uh, you know, you kind of already referenced it, but all the coaching turnover at Auburn, is that a sign of trouble? Is it maybe Parson getting guys on the same page? Because it's hard. You know, this is an SEC-wide show, and and you, you look at Tennessee, you look at South Carolina, similar situations. You know, those two programs got so much momentum under their second-year coaches where it's almost the exact opposite for Brian Harson. Uh, just where do you think the program's – Going basically is what I'm trying to ask. I think Harson just wants his own guys and the guys that he can bring in on his own. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he was kind of I think he was kind of pressured to hire some SEC guys, a la Mason, a la Bobo. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he was kind of pressured into that because, I mean, look, he's from Boise. He's never coached in the SEC. Uh, he has no experience in this conference, which is the best conference in the world. And it's a big, 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 big time job. It's a major step up from Boise or Arkansas State or wherever he was. I mean, this is a uh, top 15 program of all time. And he's also struggling with maybe the deficit of uh, – he stepped into a canyon where the previous staff didn't recruit as well as they should have, Mm -hmm. especially on the offensive line. The offensive line was horrible this year, and it it will – Tenure would be horrible unless they sign some big guys. They have a couple guys coming back, but you know, at six and two, it looks all gravy. Uh, but now, uh, with all these changes in that five-game losing st- streak, uh, it just it, it looks uh, like he's already on the hot seat, and that's something that Auburn fans are known for is the hot seat. So. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Malzahn, Malzahn pretty much lived on that for a long time. I love Gus Malzahn, great guy. Uh, but, it, I mean, people are arguing that it wasn't time for get, to get rid of him. I think it was time to get rid of him, but I don't think they made the right hire. Mm-hmm. I think they need they need to go with someone who has experience. Maybe my guy, Hugh, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, but uh, just someone who has the SEC experience and knows what they're doing and has dealt with it and won with it before. And like like someone told me uh, when Harson was hired, Kirby Smart and Nick Saban are not losing sleep ever over him being hired. Right. That is what you want the hire to be, is them being like, oh, crap, there's a new competitor here. And, you know, with Georgia and Alabama being so much higher in the level of Auburn, the two biggest rivals, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to fathom, fathom at times like this. Yeah, that's a great point because uh, we all know Hugh Freeze, his success against Nick Saban in Alabama, there was speculation he tried to hire him as an offensive coordinator. Uh, There was also reports that Georgia brought in Hugh to be a consultant. So I think you might have just hit the, you know, right on the mark. That's, That's a guy that both Kirby Smart and Nick Saban have a ton of respect for. And, you know, so you basically already answered this question, but I can't believe that I, that I had to even ask it, but because I was ready to give Harson coach of the year at six and two. Yeah, of course. Does he does he have to have a winning season? You think next season to to keep his job on the planes? Absolutely, I think so because he has not won much fan support around here. Uh, you look at Bruce Pearl, best example. It took time with him. I mean, basically, I mean, I mean, I'm not comparing football and basketball here because basketball is given more time. But Bruce went out and did things. He went out and was on a in a dunk tank the first week on campus, and he won fan support and stuff like that. Harson hasn't done that, and it's and he doesn't feel like he. I don't think he feels like he needs it needs to do that uh, because if he wins, he wins. But if they have a losing record next year, which is very possible, looking at their schedule, they have to go to Georgia, they have to go to Alabama, they play LSU, they have to play Texas A&M, uh, they play Penn State at home. I mean, that's pretty much. I mean, that's a tough schedule right there. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just hard to see him surviving another year, being an outsider, one, 
and then having two two losing seasons in a row, that's just not going to get the job done. And it's not going to be accepted here. Now, there's no way for you to know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who do you think is the starting quarterback when the season starts? Because you got T.J. Finley, you got transfer Zach Calzada and, and Robbie Ashford, who's from Oregon. And then, of course, we can't forget Demetrius Davis, who was, was a touted freshman last year. Uh, which one of those do you think uh, will get the nod? If, in a, of course, this is just a, a pure guess on your part. I, I, would, I would say Calzada is the leader right now, uh, just because of his experience playing at Texas A&M. Finley's not the answer for this offense, not for this team. Uh, Demetrius Davis, who knows? We, we saw him in practice. And that was it. We never saw him appear in a game, even with family suffering an injury in the Iron Bowl. Right. When basically Auburn just needed one first down to win the game. And uh, it's just insane that he didn't see the field. Uh, this Asher kid has not played quarterback or been on the field for, like, I don't think two years. He's more of a baseball guy, but, I mean, he's highly talented. <laughs> but right now I think it's because on his job to lose. Uh, but, if yeah, but I don't think it's uh, very clear who's going to win this I think it's going to go to fall camp. All right, last thing for you, Brian. I really appreciate all your time. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was in Washington State you covered Mike Leach. Can you yeah. can you share some insight into what it's like life uh, covering Mike Leach football team? Well, covering Mike Leach was a very difficult thing because uh, he kind of shunned me because of my boss. Um, uh, it was a very weird experience for me. Uh, I'll tell you more off the air, but. Um, yeah, uh, he's a great guy. I still stay, stay in contact with him. He invited me out to cover, in fact, his last game at Washington State. We didn't know at the time, but uh, he invited me to shadow him for three days for a feature that I ended up writing for SEC Country, or not SEC Country, my bad, Saturday Down South. And, um, you know, he's a great guy. He's a, he, you never know where, is, where the conversation is going to go. I got to sit in one of those con- quarterback meetings where he was talking about, you know, Will Clark and Mississippi State, which turned out to be an omen, and then he turns his attention to me. I'm like, well, how the hell, the hell did I get the attention here? <laughs> but but he's a great guy. He always invites me down to Key West. Uh, he's he, he's a great coach. Uh, I think he'll start winning big at Mississippi State, and uh, you know he's been uh, very very kind to me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really appreciate it. He's Brian Stoltz. Give him a follow at Brian J Stoltz and check out all his work at auburnsports.com. Brian, thank you so much. Absolutely. Anytime, my friend. All right, so I really appreciate Brian joining the line. Once again, you can follow him at Brian J. Stoltz, and that's in the podcast show notes. But, man, what insight there. The Derek Mason stuff I had not heard. Uh, Clearly, he thinks that, uh, you know, things do not seem to be trending in the right direction there on the planes, as I've kind of indicated. But it's great to hear it from someone with boots on the ground that covers the team on a daily basis. Really interesting insight there from Brian and uh, cannot wait to see where that thing is going. And he told me at the end of the call after we got off the line recording, next time some kind of disaster happens down on the planes, he's going to hop back on the show because he thinks it may not be long before something pops there. So, hey, I really appreciate Brian coming on the show and giving us a, a candid interview there. But uh, that's all we got on this episode. I do got one more guest interview lined up for uh, Friday's show. Should be a pretty fun one. And then uh, Shane and I are off to Orlando. But we're going to try to have a couple of shows next week anyway. Going to pre-record them. We've got some recruiting talk. And we got a little special episode set to air on Monday. So be on the lookout for that. We may be on vacation, but the show does not stop But, uh, hey, that's all we got on this one. I appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out. We'll catch you on the next one.